Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Stephanie Melville, a K-12 Data Science Education Impact Fellow for NCES and a member of the design team for the Math Summit. This afternoon, I have the absolute pleasure to introduce you to one of my personal heroes, Dr. Francis Sue. I'll begin with some highlights from Dr. Sue's professional biography. Dr. Francis Sue is the Benedictson Karwa Professor of Mathematics at Harvey Mudd College. He earned his PhD from Harvard University and has held visiting professorships at Cornell University and the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, California. His research focuses on geometric and topological combinatorics and their applications to the social sciences. He's published numerous scientific papers and his work on the rental harmony problem, the question of how to divide rent fairly among roommates, was featured in the New York Times. His most widely recognized book, published in 2020, is Mathematics for Human Flourishing, and it was the winner of the 2021 Euler Book Prize. It offers an inclusive vision of what math is, who it's for, and why anyone should learn it. Professor Sue weaves parables and puzzles and personal reflections to show how mathematics meets basic human desires, such as for play, beauty, freedom, justice, and love, and cultivates virtues essentials for essential for human flourishing. These desires and virtues and the stories told here reveal how mathematics is intimately tied to being human. In addition to the Euler Book Prize, in 2001, he received the Merton M. Hassa Prize for a noteworthy expository paper in a Mathematical Association of America journal by an author under 40. He earned the MAA Henry L. Alder Award for distinguished teaching by a beginning college or university faculty member in 2004. In 2013, he was awarded the Deborah and Franklin Tepper Haimo Award for distinguished college or university teaching of mathematics. In 2015 and 2016, he served as a president for the Mathematical Association of America, MAA. And in 2018, Professor Sue received the Halmos Lester R. Ford Award for articles of expository excellence in the American Mathematical Monthly. Professor Sue's notoriety as a popularizer prompted Wired Magazine to call him the mathematician who will make you fall in love with numbers. His accolades are many, but in reflecting on his own outstanding record of academic achievement, Professor Sue wrote, my family and best friends could care less about my resume and they love me with all my faults. This grace centers me, and it's a reflection of divine love that grounds human dignity in a source distinct from anything we do. This love also calls me to defend the dignity of others, which I strive to do through my teaching and my writing. Dr. Sue, I, for one, am thrilled to have you join us today. For what I'm sure will be a keynote that fills our cups, makes us feel that we are all mathematicians, and reminds us all that the work we do in education calls us to encourage, inspire, and defend the human dignity of our students every day. Dr. Sue, the virtual floor is yours. Hi, I'm Francis Sue, and I'm a professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak and to be here uh, at this conference. And many ideas uh, have been shared at the summit for improving maths education, uh, and uh, including some very practical strategies. But in this session, I want us to step back just a little bit and ask a bigger question. What is the purpose of a maths education? What is it all for? Why should a student persist in learning things that they may never use in a career? And where is the joy of learning mathematics to be found? How do you motivate a, study, a student to study a subject deeply? Now, we all know that math uh, ha has had a big impact on society. Uh, it's been profound. It allows us to do things we could never do before. Uh, and I like to think of math as equipping us to see the unseen, to unlock the hidden patterns of the world. And yet, if we only think of the technological impact of mathematics, if we only think of the applications without considering the human side of mathematics, we well, at our peril, neglect how to use these new capabilities wisely. And if we only think of the usefulness of mathematics, we're gonna ignore how math is found in the everyday things of the world and how that can delight and inspire us. 
I want to begin with uh, a story about my son, who uh, is three years old and uh, is uh, learning to speak. And of course, we know language is uh, it's very fun to watch a little person pick up language. Uh, and I just want to say it, it, it surprised us when his very first word uh, in in uh, in learning uh, learning how to speak was helicopter. Although he didn't say helicopter, he actually used the words da da da, which is kind of mimicking the sound that a helicopter makes. And you know, of course, the reason that this is a his first word is that we live in Los Angeles and there are helicopters that fly over all the time. So a very funny thing happened when the pandemic, uh, the whole first year of his life, he didn't see anybody because of the pandemic. But once things started opening up, we took him into the stores. Uh, and at one point, it was in some, I think it was a hardware store, when suddenly he said, da, da, da. And he pointed up at the ceiling. And I was thinking, wait a minute, there are, there are helicopters in this hardware store. And I looked up at the ceiling and I saw a ceiling fan, which once I saw that, I realized, oh, yes, da, da, da. That is, he was, he was associating the, uh, the way that a helicopter, the similarities between a helicopter and uh, a ceiling fan. See, he's doing something that even at a very young age is something that is mathematical. Namely, he's learning how to do abstraction. He's being able to say, this thing is like this thing, even though they look very different, even though they are very different. They have similarities. He's exhibiting what I would call a mathematical virtue. Let me ask a, a different question, uh, just to get the juices flowing. Think about a hobby that you have. Just take a moment. Think about a hobby, something that you do for fun or for enjoyment in, in some way. Now, when you think about whatever this hobby is, maybe it's hiking or maybe it's um, crocheting or maybe it's uh, running or maybe it's doing jigsaw puzzles. I claim that hobbies meet for us a basic human desire. You wouldn't do them. And so what basic desire does your hobby fulfill for you? Now, often when I've uh, asked people uh, this question, they answer it by saying, oh, well, it, it's, you know, I enjoy hiking because it's beautiful. Or I enjoy uh, playing a sport with someone because it provides a, a connection. Uh, or maybe uh, something that you do, like a jigsaw puzzle, you do because of the challenge present in it. Each of these are basic human desires, and you wouldn't do a hobby unless you were trying to meet those basic human desires. And so a question I often ask myself is, why isn't my math classroom a bit like this? Like, why, why doesn't it meet my basic human desire for beauty? Or maybe it, it should, and I, and I just need to figure out ways to do it. Or basic desire for connection, or basic desire for challenge. And uh, if you think a little bit about uh, this, it, you realize that, you know, an amazing thing happened during the pandemic. The sales of puzzles went through the roof. Why is that? Well, clearly puzzles provide an enjoyable distraction, an enchantment. And when people are experiencing deep distress, they gravitate towards things that bring them fulfillment in some way, enchantment. And doing puzzles is actually a form of mathematical thinking. We uh, enjoy doing puzzles because it provides a certain kind of challenge, maybe provides a certain kind of satisfaction in uh, solving a uh, puzzle. Uh, and uh, it's an enjoyable form of mathematical thinking. A third example, I have a friend who is an incarcerated man uh, in prison, and uh, we met when he first sent me a letter many years ago now, in which he described his love for mathematics. 
He said he had a proclivity for mathematics, but being in a very early stage of youth and also living in some adverse circumstances, he never came to understand the true meaning and benefit of pursuing education. That's what he said about how he began to study mathematics. And one of the questions I asked myself was, why in the world would he be studying mathematics? Right, it's not necessarily gonna fulfill some career for him. He's doing it because of its own intrinsic rewards. So these uh, examples, I think, help frame the question, why do mathematics, right? Why is my friend uh, in uh, studying mathematics, even though he might not use it in a career, is math only, does it only exist to make you college and career ready? Or is math only for the elite few? And of course, the perennial question every math teacher gets is this question, when will I ever use this? And if you think a little bit about it, the uh, revolution, the digital revolution uh, that is taking place even as we speak with artificial intelligence on the rise is going to make most kinds of things you might think of uh, as mathematical skills uh, obsolete, right? Like we don't need uh, to be able to do long division, for instance, by hand, uh, because we have calculators. Uh, and now, of course, uh, some e even more sophisticated things are possible because of artificial intelligence. And we have to think a little bit about how we use these tools wisely. But that begs an important question. When am I ever going to use this? Much of the mathematics we learn, you know, if in, in school, if we ask the, uh, somebody, uh, if, if a student asks us, why, when are we ever going to use this? Sometimes it's hard to answer that question because maybe they'll never use it actually in their life, especially if it's some kind of advanced skill like calculus. Now, it's not to say calculus isn't important, but uh, not everybody's going to go off into a STEM career. So how do we answer the question, why do mathematics? So I would say this, it's because mathematics helps us flourish. Mathematics is for human flourishing. When I think of human flourishing, I'm thinking of a certain wholeness of both being and doing. Uh, I think of it as a life well lived, even in difficult circumstances. And there's lots of ways various cultures have described uh, this, this idea of human flourishing. Eudaimonia is a term that's used uh, by the Greeks. Uh, shalom, salam, which are greetings in uh, Hebrew and Arabic are often uh, ways in which you describe the, the, uh, the, 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 the feeling of, of flourishing, right? You wish shalom to somebody is to wish that they would flourish and live well. And one of the ways in which people flourish, according to uh, Aristotle, is through the exercise of virtue. And when I think of virtue, I'm thinking of excellence of character that leads to excellence of conduct. So there's both a being aspect and a doing aspect to, uh, to virtue. I think of the being aspect is associated with character and the doing aspect is associated with conduct. Now, most people think of virtue as a moral virtue, right? Like, for instance, being honest. But there are many other kinds of virtues. And uh, just to put a, a picture on that point, uh, one of my students came to me after interviewing for some high power job on Wall Street and said, hey, you know what? I, I got asked the most interesting question, she said. How many times is a toilet flushed in New York City during commercial break of the Super Bowl? Now, of course, this question, which is being asked by a finance company, is, is probably not a question that this company was actually interested in, was it? Right? They were asking my student this question because they were looking for something else. Right? They, they weren't looking for specific skills like factoring quadratic. They were looking for a kind of virtue. For instance, the virtue of being able to uh, reason, to problem solve. They wanted to see how she thinks. And so when you think about this, you can often, we often think of mathematics education as skills, right? Like students uh, needing to recall certain number facts, 
or algorithms or way of doing things, uh, knowing how to factor a polynomial, take a derivative, those are skills. But I would say that virtues are more important, like the virtue of being persistent in problem solving, the virtue of creativity, the ability to tackle problems that you've never seen before. And all the stuff on the left is often the reason why students ask the question, why do I need to know this stuff, right? It, because a lot of the specific skills that students use may not be used later on in their lifetimes. On the other hand, virtues are actually what employers want, right? Virtues uh, are the things that, that you're interviewing for when you're trying to get a job. An employer wants to know if you're creative or persistent or uh, be uh, able to strategize and figure out how you might begin to answer a very, uh, a very uh, complicated question. But more than that, virtues are what make your life richer. And so just to get away from being completely practical, just for your own personal benefit, virtues enable you to see the world in a different way. They make your life richer. And so uh, when you think about it, virtues are the things that bring you wonder, delight, uh, and even joy. How do we make our math classrooms places of wonder, delight, and joy so that students are motivated to come back for more? And so that brings uh, me to, to the thought of how we might connect the, the virtues with the basic human desires. Think about the hobbies that you pursue, which you, you, you do because it meets some basic human desire. Those basic human desires are the vehicle through which virtues are developed. That's one way I like to think about it. And so I, I hope to just give you a sense of how you might begin to think about this in your own practice and in ways that this might shape the way that you think about what you do in the class. So for instance, here's a basic human desire of beauty. All of us have a desire for beauty. It causes us to step back, and to reflect, to notice, and to wonder. And when you think about what makes an experience beautiful, one reason is that it's immersive, right? When you see something beautiful, it wraps you up in it. Another feeling you get is that beauty is surprising. Like one of the, the first things that uh, I learned as a kid when uh, one of my parents' friends came over to the house and said, hey, you know, um, can you add up all the numbers from one to 100 quickly? And of course, math isn't about speed, but what they were trying to get at here is the idea that there might be a simpler way to do this problem than just adding numbers one by one. And just to do this example, uh, the simpler uh, example, if you wanna add up the numbers from one to 10, there's a beautiful way to think about it, which is if you grab, think about the numbers all lined up in a row and you grab the first and the last number, they add up to 11. And if you march inward on both ends, two and nine add up to 11 as well, three and eight add up to 11. And then you realize there are actually five pairs of numbers that add up to 11. And so five times 11 is 55. That's a quick way to answer this question. It's a beautiful way and it's kind of surprising. And I'll leave it to you to figure out if you can use this idea to add up the numbers from one to 100 uh, in a efficient way. Beauty is often paradoxical, right? We look at, a, uh, at something uh, in math uh, and we, it often causes us to step back and go, wait a minute, how can that be? Like Gabriel's horn, which has infinite surface area, but only finite volume. This means you can fill it with paint, but you can't paint it. Or like this puzzle at the bottom of the screen, which when you rearrange the pieces has a missing square. Where did that missing square go? It causes us to look closer. Beauty is often insightful, like the way that a particular picture can suddenly help you understand a, a particular algebraic identity. It brings us insight in ways uh, by looking uh, at a, a problem from many different perspectives. Beauty is seeing the unseen patterns of the world, right? Like the patterns of 
uh, spots in a uh, in a uh, uh, the giraffe, the pattern of traffic uh, on the ocean uh, on the uh, on the lake here with the the boats going uh, across the lake. We often because we see the unseen, we have a richer view of the world and what's going on. And so if you're learning to think about teaching beauty, one of the things we'll have to do is motivate the stuff that we're learning in diverse ways. We have to learn to appreciate patterns everywhere. In art, in music, in rhythm, in culture, we have to dig deep to understand ideas, reasoning, and applications. I like this uh, quote by David Blackwell, famous statistician. Why do you want to share something beautiful with someone else? It's because of the pleasure she will get and in transmitting it, you appreciate its beauty all over again. And beauty builds in us certain virtues, like the virtue of being able to reflect. It brings in us joyful gratitude, transcendent awe, and it builds in us habits of generalization, which uh, allow us to see principles uh, instead of just seeing only uh, what's right before us. I like to encourage a beauty through reflection by asking questions that ask my, have my students reflect on the ideas that they find beautiful. And I often learn something by reading these reflections uh, about what my students think about mathematics and ways that they have of thinking mathematics is beautiful that inform my own teaching practice. Like this one example of a student who found some idea that I didn't think was beautiful and showed me what was beautiful about it. And often I see that my students see the beauty of mathematics as connection, connecting ideas that they previously never saw connected. There's another basic human desire, the desire to explore. Exploration uh, is what happens uh, when we do it, is we're captivated by mystery, we're motivated by questions, we're unfazed by setbacks. And so a math question, uh, is dull if it asks you to just do something like compute, but it's exploratory if it asks you to think deeply about the idea. And students often find these questions more interesting, like creating a rectangle so that the first has a bigger perimeter and the second has a bigger area, asks you to wrestle with a deep idea and you can be creative in problem solving it. And it builds in us virtues like imagination and creativity and the experience expectation of enchantment. Like when you see something uh, that you didn't expect to find, like this deep sea ocean creature with a light at the end of its nose, that's enchantment. Or when you see a mathematical figure that when you slice it, it looks like it, it this figure is a bunch of squares with uh, cut out of a big square. And you find by slicing it, you get a bunch of hexagonal stars, that's enchantment. Right? This is what keeps students coming back for more. And so how do you train your students to expect enchantment every time they come to your classroom? So one thing I do in my practice is I basically make sure that every homework I assign has one exploratory problem on it. Okay, so just to sum up then, that I, I've just given a few examples here, but I, I want you to think about maths as virtues, not just skills. There's lots of virtues that you can build in your mathematics practice. Affection for the subject, enchantment, hopefulness, persistence, imagination, interpretation, definition, quantification. These are all ways of being mathematical. There are many ways of being mathematical. When you, a student might be able to visualize even if they aren't able to compute, right? So being, uh, seeing the many different ways to be mathematical is actually important for equity for helping students see themselves as mathematical people. There's lots of ways to be mathematical, and the more that we can emphasize that, the better off we'll be. So what's happened to maths education? If virtues are so important, why do we focus primarily on assessing skills? And uh, of course, one answer to that question is skills are easy to assess, but virtues are not. 
Another question with, that is worth thinking about is why do we remove all the best parts of the math experience, the parts that make them feel human, away from our classrooms? Now, I don't have an easy answer to that question, but I do know one thing. We don't need better human calculators, right? In an age of, of AI and uh, uh, computational uh, equipment that's very, very, makes a lot of solving lots of math problems easy, it's actually the virtues that are gonna be more important to a student's uh, career, but also to their lives. And so I often use reflection to help students begin to think about virtue. And I have a blog, a post, if you just Google seven exam questions for a pandemic, you'll see many examples of how I cultivate and encourage virtue through, my, uh, by, through uh, reflection questions. So the main takeaway that I hope you'll leave this presentation with is that students have more to learn in our classes than just skills. We should all aim to teach mathematics through uh, thinking about what it means for our students to flourish, teach towards human flourishing. Thank you very much.